Hello, welcome into WLOI, Loyola Radio, streaming online at WLOI.org and Campus TV Channel 111.1. You're listening to After the Whistle, Loyola's premier sports talk radio show, airing every Monday from 3 to 4 p.m. and every Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. Welcome into another Monday edition of the show. I am your host, today, Jeffrey Bozzi, alongside my co-host, Jimmy Cody. Jimmy, how is your Monday? My Monday is good, Jeffrey. Thank you for asking. I appreciate uh, you asking that. How was your Monday? Uh, pretty solid so far. I just got a lot on my plate, but you know what? I'm trying to get through everything. This weather, by the way, recently has been amazing, and it's continued today. It's pretty sunny, a little cloudy now, but it's been in the 60s. We've had some days in the 80s. I mean, the weather's definitely taking a turn as we get into spring, but yeah, my day's going well so far. We're kind of in this thick of the home stretch here with the semester, just a lot going on. I feel like not just in the classroom, but outside of the classroom too. Yeah. You know, Not sure if you feel the same. No, yeah. There's definitely a lot going on on all fronts, but you know, we still got a lot of sports to talk about. That's one thing that I know for sure. We still got a lot going on baseball, basketball, hockey, um, lacrosse. Um, it's all a lot of fun stuff. And the NFL draft is next week too. So yeah. It's going to be really it's exciting. It's one of those time periods. It's like a culmination of a lot Lucky of different Derby things. in a couple of weeks too. I mean, we have a lot of seasons that are starting to playoffs. We have a lot of exciting sports events that have already happened recently and exciting ones like the Kentucky Derby you said that are coming up. There's just a lot happening. But let's go into the NBA playoffs to start. We had all of the game ones happen over the weekend on Saturday and Sunday. And let's just go in order because there's a lot of storylines, especially from yesterday's games. But we'll go into Saturday's games to start. We had the Brooklyn Nets taking on the Philadelphia 76ers. And it was pretty much a cruise control win for the Sixers. They won 121 to 101. And I think the standouts here were Joel Embiid and James Harden. Joel Embiid dropping 26 points and James Harden dropping 23 points along with 13 assists. And they pretty much just cruised along to a win. They also made 21 three-pointers, which is, I think, the record for most made three-pointers in a Sixers playoff game, if I have that correctly. But... Brooklyn was around the game for most of it. I think the offense or lack thereof just kind of faltered, especially later in the game. And you saw Mikhail Bridges come out really hot and then he, he slowed down a little bit, but he's definitely a guy that you have to keep an eye on, especially tonight because the two teams will meet up tonight in game two in Philadelphia. But Jimmy, what did you see from the Nets and Sixers game one? What are your takeaways? Well, I thought the Sixers offense was obviously the main key of the game. Um, particularly the way they shot from three, like you had said, Jeffrey, they were really good. And Harden particularly was really good for them as well. And at the end of the day for the Sixers, I feel like this was kind of something they expected, right? Like they expected that they should be able to play well against the Nets. When you really kind of consider where the Nets are, especially after the way their season has gone, like I think this roster that the Nets currently have, if they had had it since the beginning of the season, they probably wouldn't be this high of a, high of a seed, right? They would definitely not be a six. I mean, early on in the season, they were not just a one seed, but they were always around two or three. And they were kind of just floating around there. But then obviously, Katie and Kyrie get traded and then they falter a little bit. But And they also are dealing with the Ben Simmons, just a disaster, right? I mean, yeah, ironically that these are the two teams that meet up in the first round. Yeah, I don't even know. Like, concerning what, the Sixers. I don't even team. know what Ben Simmons is going to do next year. But I guess that's really not the focus right now. It's obviously on the Sixers. And the Nets, and for the Nets, um, it, it just kind of stinks because I just feel like they're so overmatched. That's really like ultimately how I feel, and I do expect the Sixers to win this series. But if the Nets are going to do it right, like what what realistically do they need to have happen? Number one, they can't give up 121 points. They're going to have to try way harder on defense. They're going to have to be way better on defense. That can't happen. There's there's no way that the Nets are going to be able to put up over 120 every single game. So they certainly can't be doing that to the Sixers. Realistically, I think that if they're going to have any chance of win, they can't let the Sixers score more than like 110, right? Like they're going to have they're going to have to probably score more than that themselves. But that's what the Nets would have to do. And I just don't know if that's really possible. 
Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. They have some guys who can score. I mean, look at Mikael Bridges. He's clearly the number one option. He's been great ever since he came over from Phoenix. But that's one player and that they, realistically could put up 25. And listen, day. no discredit to Mikael Bridges. He's a great player, but it's not like he's a number one option or maybe on he will, another team. I mean, he maybe, can he, be. maybe he can be in the long run. But to run. contend, he's not a number one option. As of now, he's not. No. I, I mean, he kind of is, though, when you think about it. He is number one on the Nets. That's true. But it he still gave them 30. Like, how much yeah. more do you really want from the guy? No, I mean, and I was going to bring up, they have other guys who can score. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't like he was inaccurate. I shooting. mean, if Cam Johnson, who's a good shooter, they didn't win, and those guys can score too. I just think they need more for the bench. I mean, Joe Harris is a guy who's been known to knock down three-pointers. Yeah, Harris. If nothing. Harris has really fallen off. Too. Curry was all right. Seth Curry is another guy who can make shots, but Patty Mills didn't even play. I think he's a guy who can make shots. I'm not sure why he's not really playing much. And how about Cam Thomas? We saw Cam Thomas... Right after the trades, going that 40-point outburst for three games. I know it's only three games, but he's proven that he can score, and he didn't play much either. So I think the Nets have a shot in this series. They need help from not just Bridges. They need help from other guys. And listen, I don't know if they're going to get that help consistently. Can it be there for one or two games? Maybe. But over the course of a seven-game series, I think, like you said, they have to find a way to – contain the Philly offense. You can't give up 121. Like you said, that's a lot of points, especially for a team like the Nets, who's not really proven to score too many points. I think keeping the Sixers around 100 or maybe even 110 will give them more of a shot. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's kind of the only chance they have. I think that's where it starts for a team like them, right? Yes. Yeah, certainly it does. Um, All right, should we move on to the next game? Yeah, so we'll go up to Boston for this one. The Hawks took on the Celtics in game one of their series. And again, it's kind of a similar situation to the Nets Sixers game. The Celtics were in cruise control the whole way. They went up big. I think they were up 30 or 40 points throughout the game, and they ended up 30. winning. Yes, they ended up winning 112 to 99. And the story here is obviously the fantastic dynamic duo of Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Jason Tatum going for 25 and 11, 25 points, 11 rebounds. Jalen Brown going for 29 points and 12 rebounds, which is, I think, a good sign for Celtics fans, considering that he had a hand injury going into the game. And I think he said he felt a little discomfort, but clearly it didn't bother him in this game. So I think it's an encouraging sign to see their number two option kind of get back to what we're used to seeing. But yeah, for Atlanta, they just had an awful shooting day. I mean, they couldn't get anything going. They were five for 29, Jimmy, from three-point land. I'm not sure if you saw that. but That's not going to cut it. When you have Trey Young not making threes, it's kind of hard to win because they have other guys who can score, but not really anyone that's going to stand out like a Trey Young. So, Jimmy, I don't know if you caught any of this game, but it seemed like Celtics were in cruise control. But what did you think? What are the keys here for Atlanta to maybe get back in the series? Or, I don't know, what do you think Boston needs to keep doing? Well, if Atlanta's going to get back in the series, I think there's only really one guy on their team who can make that happen, and that's Trey Young. And he can't go five for 18. That's certainly, like, an obvious statement. We can all say that, right? So he put up 16 for them. Realistically, if they're going to have a chance, he probably has to put up, what, 35 at least? Um, and 15, or, or I'm sorry, 16, as we know, is not 35. So what are the other areas that they can improve? The boards. I thought they got killed on the boards. It was like... The Celtics were just so much better than them on the re- on the boards, which is interesting because I thought the Hawks actually did a really good job in the play-in of, of like, rebounding. And like, I thought that was one of the things that stood out from my point of view. Like, I thought they did a pretty good job, particularly on offense. Now, here's the second thing. We know the offense could be better. The defense, it's really not that awful. Like, you kind of expect guys like Tatum and Brown to put up those kind of games like you know that that's going to happen but they only gave up 112 it could be so much worse right especially when you consider that the game was kind of a blowout for most of it right um but at the same time we know that the celtics are capable of putting up way more than 112 anytime that they step out there on the floor and there's a chance that it can happen again next game where the uh, the Hawks offense does improve, but the Celtics offense plays even better than it did in this one. And if that happens, the Hawks really have no chance. So I think it's a combination of things. The Hawks definitely need to keep up the pressure on the defensive side of the ball, particularly against the star players, Tatum and Brown, because those are the guys that do the most damage. And then they're also going to need their star player, Trey Young, to step up. Um, 
I, I don't know about you too. I didn't think DeJounte Murray played honestly like that bad. He still put up a decent amount of points, but at the same time too, they're just so ineffective as a team from three that it just doesn't really matter how many points you put up because most of their shots were just being wasted on missed threes. Yeah. I think going forward, I think one encouraging thing for the Hawks is their defense was way better in the second half. They only gave up 38 points in the second half after giving up 45, which is a lot in one quarter, the second quarter specifically. But yeah, I think for the Hawks, they need other guys to chip in. And I think it starts with Young and Murray. I think those are the two guys they're going to have to carry the load. But defensively, like you said, they got to find a way to contain Tatum and Brown. Like, listen, they're going to get their points. I mean, there's, I don't think any denying that, but maybe limit them in the low twenties as opposed to maybe the thirties, maybe that will make somewhat of a difference, but yeah, I just don't know if the Hawks have enough firepower, like you said, and I don't know if they're going to be able to score in the one tens and one twenties for six of more games of the series. And I think Boston scoring one twelve. I mean, that's a respectable number, but we definitely know, like you said, they can score more than that. Yeah, certainly. So let's go to this next game, and this is going to make you happy, Jimmy. The Knicks, they took down the Cavs in Cleveland, 101-97 on Saturday night. And I thought from start to finish, this was a fantastic game. Got very scary in the end. I thought the Knicks, for the most part, were in pretty much total control. I thought they came out pretty well in the first quarter, and they kind of just kept the lead and kind of did everything right. But Cleveland made a hell of a run in the fourth quarter, and they actually took the lead briefly before the Knicks retook the lead and won by four. And Jalen Brunson was awesome. I mean, we talked about him, I believe, last Friday before this series started. And we were talking about how this pickup was used for the Knicks. And he showed them why he's kind of worth the contract. I mean, he dropped 27. I mean, he was just efficient. And he makes timely shots. I think mean, he's kind of become like a clutch player ever since last year's playoffs. Jeff, he's by far the best player on the team. Like, of yeah. course the contract is worth it. They would not have won this game without him at all. Yeah. There was nobody else, with the exception of Randall, who, by the way, still took a lot of shots and really wasn't that productive, When you, especially when you consider the way that Brunson played. And there was also R.J. Barrett, who was completely unproductive out there. Really, the only other guy that gave us offense, besides Brunson, and I guess you could say Randall, was Josh Hart. Yeah. Off the bench, Josh Hart. Is literally Talk about a newer player as well. A, season a new player. So yeah, Jalen Brunson. Yes, he was certainly worth the contract because they don't win this game without him. We got to 101 points and we only gave up 97, obviously. But that 101, I mean, we were holding on for dear life. The offense in the second half was brutal. Yeah, and you saw Cleveland not really making a run in the third quarter, but more so in the fourth quarter than they did. But yeah, I think early on, I just think the Cavs were not in sync offensively. I thought it was our defense. I thought our defense was pretty good, and that was kind of like what set the tempo for the game. And thank God we came out with a strong defensive intensity because we just didn't look good on offense. You're not going to be able to win a lot of games in the NBA only putting up 101, right? No, you're not going to win a lot of no, games there. at all. And especially when your best player is putting up 27, like – we really have to rely on Jalen Brunson. But if you look at everybody else, I mean, really, R.J. Barrett was the guy that I would say was by far the most disappointing. And then if I had to give another, like, most disappointing a person of the game, I would give it to probably Emmanuel quickly. He only gave us three points in 24 minutes. Yeah, and for the season that he's had, that's definitely not a custom. Yes, man. and he's been playing outstanding, like not, I, w- I wouldn't say outstanding, but at a nice level, a high level. I mean, sure. he's a sixth man of the year finalist for a reason. He's had yeah, a great year but there. recently has been like his, I think, best ball, I would say for the last like month and a half or so. Um, I really feel like that was like the Emmanuel quickly, like, hey, this guy is a real NBA player. Like he can really help us. But three points in the playoff game, come on, that's not good enough. And for the Knicks, I hate to bring this back up, but, you know, the last time that they, we were in the playoffs, we obviously played the Hawks and we won the first game. And then it didn't matter because the rest of the series, our star players did not show up. And I don't want to say that that seems like a theme here again, but it's definitely some concerns that I have after the first game. All I can say is, though, thank God for Jalen Brunson as a Nick fan. Yeah, no, he's been awesome. He's definitely been worth the contract for sure. And the fact that you have him for multiple years after this season is obviously a good thing to have. But how about the defense? The defense was phenomenal. And sometimes we talk about this when you play teams. And I'm not saying Cleveland's one of these teams. Sometimes 
you play a team, they have this one great player. Like, I'll take if you're playing the Dallas Mavericks and, Luka you, and you have to guard Luca. Listen, like, do you try to completely shut him down and make the others beat you, or do you let him kind of just go off and you try to make the others beat you? Like, I know it sounds like the same statement, but I think for the Knicks, they kind of let Mitchell, Garland, and Mobley and Allen kind of do their thing, but they completely shut down the others. And I'm not saying Mobley played well, he only had eight points, but. Mitchell had 38. He took 30 shots. Garland took 13 shots. Mobley took 13 shots. They didn't really get any other help besides the three of them. I mean, I would say Jared Allen would be the other exception. He had 14 points, but Coro didn't really do much. Wade didn't do much. Osmond, nothing much. He had a couple threes. Yeah. But Ricky Rubio, no points. Karis LeVert, who I think is their best bench player, he had three points. And he's kind of like the... Emmanuel quickly of their team. Not saying he is having a better year than quickly. I think quickly is better than Levert, but that's the guy that they need to score for off from off the bench. And he did nothing. So I think the Knicks did a good job of kind of letting the three guys cook and then shut down the rest. Really wasn't like a great basketball game for either team. Like I think the Knicks are fortunate that they won this game. I, I fully expect the Cavs offense to be way better in game two though at home. Yeah. I think they need to come out with more of a purpose. I feel like they didn't really get many people involved. And I know that's the nature of the playoffs. It kind of slows down. You kind of let your top guys try to take over. And Mitchell definitely did that at the end, but it wasn't enough. I think for the Cavs especially, they need to start better. But, yeah, I think this series is going to be great. I mean, based on the first game and the drama at the end, I think this is going to be a great series. But speaking of drama. I I agree. I think it's going to be a great series as well. Yeah, I think it's going to go six or seven for sure but speaking of drama how about the warriors kings game one i mean that was probably one of the best game ones i've seen in recent memory i'm not sure if you think the same but the kings they haven't made the playoffs in very very long time and how about this they come out and they beat the warriors 126 123 in front of a a ruckus crowd just trying to think of the word for a second a ruckus crowd in sacramento and Jimmy, what happened here? Because a lot of people were thinking, oh, Warriors going to come in. They're more experienced. They got Steph, Clay, Dre, and whoever. They're going to come in and beat the Kings. No disrespect to the Kings, but the Warriors have all these guys. But no, the Kings said, no, 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 absolutely not. We're here to stay. So what did you see from this game? Well, I mean, I was super impressed with the Kings offense, really. I mean, De'Aaron Fox, right, putting up 38, like that's a clutch performance. That's what you need out of your star player. And that was what the Kings got out of their star player. And honestly, their other star player, Sabonis, he only put up 12. So really, it was De'Aaron Fox kind of carrying. And I don't mean to interject, but Sabonis had more rebounds than points. He had 16 boards, which is very impressive. Mm -hmm. That is very impressive. Absolutely. But you're right. No, I mean, he's somebody who you would probably expect to score more, especially if the Kings are putting up 126. Um and also, too, I would be remiss if I did not also say Malik Monk having 32 off the bench is a monster game. I mean, I don't think anybody saw that coming, but that's got to be Malik Monk's probably biggest performance in an NBA game that I can remember. I mean, this guy was a very high draft pick out of Kentucky. He played with De'Aaron Fox at Kentucky. They were um, in the same uh, class, and then they also got drafted. That team went pretty far in March Madness. I think they went to the Elite Eight, if I remember correctly. But... I mean, this is definitely the biggest performance in his game and him going for 32. I mean, are you kidding me? I I would, there was no shot. I would see that coming before this. And I don't know if you saw Jeffrey, what Draymond Green had to say, um, but it was about how you can't really expect Malik Monk to go for 32 again. Like they can't let that happen. Interesting. I did not see that comment until you brought Uh, it up. Rui Hakamura also said that about, or I'm sorry, uh, Dylan Brooks said that about Rui Hakamura. Oh, okay. I know Dylan Brooks did say that he's mind playing LeBron in a three game series. Yeah. Or seven game series. I don't know why I said three, but, but interesting. Yeah. I mean, I just would not, I was very surprised by the game that Malik Monk had. And I think that's ultimately the reason that the Kings won, right? Yeah. I mean, this was a back and forth game throughout. There wasn't really a team that kind of jumped out to a huge lead. I think the Warriors got out to maybe a five or 10 point lead, but nothing more than that. And, not sure how big of a lead the Kings had in this game, but yeah, this is just a great back and forth seesaw battle. And I think that is what we're going to expect in this series. I mean, Kings not being in the playoffs forever, they kind of have this Renaissance team that wasn't really expected much of this year, but 
hey, they've proven that they play really well together as a unit. And then you have the Warriors who are obviously more star driven. But yeah, I think for the Warriors, they just got to find a way to fix their defense. I mean, clearly the offense. Is I don't know. Wrong. How about Draymond only putting up four points? Yeah. But I see to me like that. I know that's obviously not a high point total. And I know he's probably going to average around like 10 ish. But I think Curry, Thompson, and Poole are going to be the three guys who are mainly going to score. And now that they work back Wiggins in, he had 17. I think that's a pretty encouraging sign. And he's obviously a starter nine times out of 10. He's just kind of working back from a personal matter. But I think it's the defense for the Warriors. They got to find a way to stop the Kings from scoring 126. Because I think the Kings, listen, they have Fox and Sabonis, who are probably going to be the two guys who are going to lead the team in scoring most nights. But you can't let Fox go for 38. I mean, from a Warriors perspective, I mean, that's a lot of points. And I know that he's a factor from especially driving in the lane because he's just so fast. But especially Malik Monk, too, you got to find a way to shut down these guys. And I'm sure they'll come in tonight because that's when they play again is tonight. Maybe they'll come in with a better plan. But I think for the Warriors, they got to fix the defense. I am not too worried about them putting up like 123 again because I think they can do it. No, yeah, I think defensively is definitely where it starts, especially when you look at those massive amounts of points from Malik Monk and De'Aaron Fox. Um, I also think they'll shoot a little bit better from three going forward. I mean, they didn't really have a great game from three, and that's kind of what they do best. But at the same time, I am expecting them to bounce back on both sides of the ball. And they do have the star power, and I feel like this is one game. Like, let's see if Sacramento can play at this level for a long series. We know the Warriors can. Yeah, and I think that shows in the Vegas line tonight. Golden State's minus two. So I think a lot of people, Vegas themselves too, expect the Warriors to bounce back. Yeah, certainly. But there's a little bit of pressure there. I mean, you dropped the first one. You don't want to go to 2-0 going home. But And I know that the Warriors have a great home crowd. But we'll see how that plays out tonight. Should be a great one out in Sacramento. But let's go to the slate to, uh, from yesterday. We had the Lakers going into Memphis, pulling off an upset win. They took down the Grizzlies. 128 112 and one thing to note obviously from this game on the memphis side of things is john morant going down with that injury yeah and then also anthony davis acting like he was um dead because he had a stinger in his arm i mean (laughs) he said he couldn't feel his arm yeah um but he came back into the game right he did he came back and ultimately helped the lakers win by 16 and not to mention austin reeves austin reeves was phenomenal austin reeves how about rui hakamura yeah rui hachimura was phenomenal off the bench i believe he had 29 reeves as i mentioned at 23 hachimura was just awesome and i'll just bring up both of them for the sake of this they're key additions to this team and i think this is the reason why they got them they needed help besides lebron and ad and this is the help that they're getting they also just have better players than they had like they went a lot more younger they kind of played i think to lebron's strengths I've always said I felt like the best guys to surround LeBron with, especially when you already have another star big guy like like Anthony Davis. Like, okay, he's a big guy. He's not going to interfere with LeBron's game too much. They can coexist. And then you got a guy like D'Lo who can play on ball, off ball. Like, he could do a little bit of both. But realistically, what is the best thing to do besides that? Three and D guys. And they have a team full of them, right? Yeah, Malik Beasley, um, Jared Vanderbilt to a lesser extent from three. Troy Brown. Troy Brown, Austin Reeves is a very good 3 and D player. I'm not saying he is a 3 and D player, but he can make threes and he can play pretty good defense. Same with Hachimura. Yeah, I mean, you think about the roster that they have here. They've kind of just, like, what is the best thing to put around around LeBron? And I have to say, this is a phenomenally built team, I think. I really do think that they they fix all this at the trade deadline is unbelievable. It is. It actually, if they do make a run, I'll just leave it at that, a run, it would probably be one of the best trade deadlines I think ever in any sport. Yeah. And I'm not going to jump because it's John. Role, because it's role players, which is so much harder than stars. Okay. Yeah. You add a star, you know what you're getting most of the time with a star, right? Or at least there's an expectation there with a role player. You don't know if it's coaching. You don't know if it's the star players on another team, making them better. That is so much tougher to do. Yeah. And this reminds me of when the Lakers won the title in 2020, they had LeBron and AD, as we all know. And they had a pretty good supporting guys. Caruso. They had Alex Caruso, Contavious Caldwell Pope, and Danny Green. Guys that are not great players, but they're just solid good players. And but D'Angelo Russell also, too. Like, he's not a role player. Like, he, no, he's not. We, we shouldn't describe him as that. Like, D'Lo is a third, like, can be a third option on a team. Like, he, he was the second option, I'd say, in Minnesota. 
Yeah. So he's like the third option now on this team and behind Anthony Davis and LeBron. Like, yeah, you can't do much better than that. Yeah. I just think for the Lakers over the last few years when they've kind of been bad, is just they kind of had no role players that really were good. And now they're kind of getting back to it with Reeves and Hachimura and Vanderbilt and Beasley and Russell and whoever else. But yeah, I think this is a huge win for them. Obviously, they had to steal one in Memphis to win the series. And now they did that. I think they can check that box off. But I think going forward, though, Jimmy, I'll ask you, for Memphis, I mean, where do they go from here? John Moran hurt his hand. I think the x-rays are negative, so we don't really know if he's going to play. They do have two more days to figure this out. They don't play again on Wednesday night. But do you think Memphis can win this series with no jaw? Like, jaw's got to be there, right? Well, they might not be able to win it with no jaw because that's going to be really tough. And we saw the impact that that had on them. Like, especially last year when they played the Warriors, they were just not the same team. And I know they have a really good regular season record without job, but this isn't the regular season. So that is out the window to me Um, because you need star players. And the performance they got from Jaron Jackson Jr. helps Um, him putting up 31. Yes, you need that. But at the same time, can he do that every single game? I don't know. It's going to be really, really tough. And then also, too. You know who got a lot of minutes, and I would be kind of remiss if I didn't give him a little bit of a shout out. Santi played a pretty decent amount, I thought yesterday. Like he really was out there a lot. He only had eight points on three of six from the field, two of three from three point land, and he had six rebounds and two assists. So you know he was out there, he was doing some stuff. Great job, Santi. So I feel I feel like we got to give a Santi, yeah, shout out just because he's from Loyola. Makes everyone at Loyola proud. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know what. The jaw situation, I would expect Santi to kind of find a way into getting more minutes because they got to kind of find some offensive flexibility. I mean, I know they're going to use Kennard and Tyus Jones um, because that's really their main options at guard besides um, John Morant and then Desmond Bain. Yeah. Uh, And then if Morant's out, one of those two has to go into the starting line. Right. I would assume Tyus Jones because he's a true point guard. Um, and he got a lot of minutes in replace of job, but at the same time too, it's like, like where, where do the uh, Grizzlies go from here? If they don't have job, like, I think that they're kind of outmatched in the series if they don't have John Morant. Yeah. Jaw's their lead dog. And they already don't have Steven Adams. Yeah. And I was going to bring that up with Santi Aldama playing a lot. And if Jaw's out, obviously that frees up another spot for someone to go start and also maybe play more off the bench. And I think Santi already with, Brandon Clark and Steven Adams out. I mean, he's definitely going to play probably more than he did in the regular season. But, yeah, I think without Shaw, I just don't know where the offense goes. I mean, I think Triple J would be the number one guy. But oh, it's just tough because Shaw is just such a game changer with the speed he can get inside, too, and he can kick it out to guys who can shoot threes. It's just, I don't know, they're kind of at a crossroads here. Yeah, it's really tough. I will say for them, though, they this is a must-win game, too. They go down 2-0 going to L.A., they're in trouble. Yeah, it is. And the fact that John ja might not play, it, that yeah, we don't gonna, really know. That's going to put them in a really bad series because it is it is so tough to go to L.A. and win two back-to-back, right, to get yourself to even. Best-case scenario, you come out of there down 3-1, like most likely, yeah. after the first four games. That's really tough, even if you're going back to Memphis for five and then hopefully seven if you can win game six in L.A. and game five at home. But at the same time, I mean, it's an uphill battle for the Grizzlies if Ja does not play game two. Yeah, they got a lot to figure out. But, yeah, good start for the Lakers, though, nonetheless. Now, how about this? The Heat and Bucks, completely out of nowhere. The Heat take down the Bucks 130-117. And we'd be remiss to not mention another key injury actually two key injuries in this game that occurred Tyler Hero and Giannis and Tedekupo I'll start with Tyler Hero he hurt his hand I believe in the second half or maybe the end of the first half of the game yesterday and he was ruled out not just for the game but he's also been ruled out for four to six weeks so depending on how far the heat go he will not be there for the foreseeable future and then you look at Giannis he was driving in the lane when he got hurt yesterday and we're not really sure what his status is for game two. It seems like it's going to be in the right direction. That's the reports that we've been getting today. And the injury is a back injury. But, yeah, obviously not having Giannis for the rest of that game hurt the box. And they did make a run, but the Heat were ultimately holding on to their lead, and they did so. So what you see from this game, I mean, obviously kind of a shocker. 
Yeah, no Giannis though just completely changes the box. Like it's just I don't even know if it's the box. It's just the the yucks, I guess. I don't even know. That just makes me say yuck <laughs> watching their offense without Giannis. I mean, Chris Middleton's that becomes the number one option. And no offense to Chris Middleton, he's a really nice player, has had a really nice career. Um, but he is nowhere near the level of Giannis onto the Kumbo in any way possible. And not having Giannis, who's what at least a top three or four player in the league, um, that completely changes your team. So they need to get Giannis back as fast as possible. I'm not really sure what the timetable is on his injury. Was there an announcement on when he's going to be coming back? I think he's going to play game two. Okay. That's what they hope. That's the hope that he'll play game two. I certainly hope for the Bucks' sake, and the Bucks should hope for their sake, that Giannis does play in game two. Because if they don't have him in game two, I don't know. I think it's it's iffy if they're going to be able to win that game. I mean, it's still, I think, a game they can win because I don't think that highly of Miami. But at the same time, when they play like this, they're starting lineup. I mean, what more could you want? Yeah, and it starts with Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo, who both played great yesterday. I mean, look at Jimmy Butler. I feel like he had a most quiet 35 points ever. I mean, I felt like throughout the game, I mean, yeah, he was getting his, but – it's not like he was like taking over. Mm-hmm. It's not like well, it wasn't he was a lot of threes. Football. It was a lot of yeah, a two lot of shots. two point shots, which is kind of his specialty, especially in the mid range. And he also had eleven assists too. Yeah, he's dishing it out to guys, and it sucks for the Heat too because if you're looking at this going into game two, you're thinking maybe Giannis won't play. Maybe there's a chance he won't get out there. Imagine if Tyler Hero doesn't get hurt because I think Tyler Hero is such a key part to the Heat. I mean, he's probably one or two on their three-point shooting, along with Duncan Robinson. I mean, he's probably their best or second-best three-point shooter. I mean, he's a guy who can really fill it up. And I know he only had 12, but like he's a guy who can just make shots from anywhere on the court. But for the rest of their team, I mean, they got help from Gabe Vincent. They had help from Caleb Martin, even Kevin Love. Yeah, I was going to say, the Kevin Love, like, throwback game. He has 18 off the bench, and he's four of seven from three, putting up eight rebounds. How about Kevin Love? Like, kind of coming out of nowhere. Yeah, and it's free. It's crazy too because Kyle Lowry was the starter this year. Just thinking of another bench player, he only had 19 minutes and he only had two points. But to have Kevin Love come in a midseason acquisition and kind of turn back the clock, I mean, if you're the Heat, I mean, if you're getting that more often than not, yeah, that Lowry uh, contract is not looking too great right now. No, I feel like Heat fans just expect more. I think everyone expected more, but it's just the guy just getting old, right? It's just shocking he's not even starting. He just and I know that your play just, will determine that. But. Yeah, but he's just not the same guy anymore at all. And I don't even know what like this is weird, but I was I was questioned what was Kyle Lowry's like best attribute? What was he like the what was the best thing that he did? Like I realistically, I don't even know what he can like hang his hat like on throughout his career. Yeah, like at least when Carmelo was like at the end of his career, who was like I would say a player who was better than Kyle Lowry. Like and he was like, all right, like he can score, right? Like he could be a, a scoring bench option. Like what is Kyle Lowry? Like I he was never a great scorer. Assists he was an okay passer, but I he never like led the league in assists or really was like a majorly like great assist guy he was a good passer but i would never say like great defensively he was he was wasn't like the most athletic guy yeah so i think he, he honestly he gave a, like a lot of effort but he like what was he good at i, I can't even like i think, think it's a valid question to bring up at least from like what is he over the years on it? like it, it, over the years when i've watched him play more specifically when he was in toronto he's kind of known as a tough-minded point guard i think that is true and he's kind of a good leader in the locker room and i know that doesn't really sound like it's adding up to things on the court, but he's just a solid player. I mean, that's kind of what I've heard and kind of what I've noticed. But, yeah, it's not like he stands out in one specific area. He definitely does not stand out in one area, like shooting, passing, rebounding, whatever. But, yeah, to see him fall this quickly is kind of cr- kind of nuts, kind of crazy. Yeah, I would say the biggest two shockers were probably him and Russell Westbrook of guys that yeah. completely fell. And off. I'm not sure if there's any truth to this statement, but I felt like I noticed Kyle Lowry not really having as much value. I'm not sure if that's the right wording, but maybe being a little overrated would be in the 2019 finals because I thought he was clearly the number two option behind Kawhi Leonard on that team. Oh, but, but they didn't win because of Kawhi but or because of but, Kyle. But I think P- Pascal Siakam was clearly the number two option, and I kind of noticed it there, and I wasn't sure if that was just a one-time thing or Kyle Lowry just 
really wasn't as good as we thought. And I think he's a good player. Don't get me wrong, but I don't know. I think when people say, oh, Kyle Lowry, Kyle Lowry, it's not like he's putting up 20 or dishing out 10 assists. He's also kind of old, too. Yeah, I think he's in yeah, the he's, yeah, he's, back end of his he's career. He's 37. Like, Listen, if he's a backup point guard, though, in a playoff team, I mean, I would take him as a backup point guard. Yeah, it just stinks because they're paying him a lot, so you can't really pay a backup point guard that much. Yeah. But at the same time, um, he did bring a championship to Toronto, so he should be remembered for that in a positive way. Um, yeah, and then we got the Clippers and Suns and then the Timberwolves and Nuggets. Do you want to take a quick break and talk about those? Because I know. Yeah, I think we should. Yeah. We definitely have a lot for Clippers Suns because that was – a little surprising, but I think it's definitely worth talking about a little more extensively. So we'll take a quick break here. And after this, we'll be right back. Hello, welcome back to WLOI, Loyola Radio, streaming online at WLOI.org and Campus TV channel 101.1. You're listening to After the Whistle with Jeffrey Bozzi and Jimmy Cody. We're going to pick back up on our NBA playoffs talk. We have two more games to Discuss. We're going to start with the first one. The Clippers and the Suns, they faced off in Phoenix last night. It's the 4 5 matchup in the West. And I think people coming into this series, Jimmy, expected this to be kind of a dogfight series. I mean, the Clippers are kind of a tough minded team. Then you have the Suns, who boast a lot of star power with Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, Chris Paul, DeAndre Ayton, and others. But how about the Clippers? They come out and They were honestly in cruise control early on. They really put their foot down. I think they were up as many as 16 in the first half, and they were still up by a decent margin at halftime. But you saw the Suns kind of assert themselves and make a run in the second half. But ultimately, it was because of Kawhi Leonard and others that the Clippers found a way to come away with a 115-110 win. So, Jimmy, I'm just going to hand it right to you. What did you see here? How did the Clippers steal game one? It's just like, I don't even know how to describe this, but like Kawhi Leonard just goes through these phases where we seem to always forget about him due to his injury or when he takes his just time away. Like realistically, I feel like this dude's been missing from basketball for like the last two seasons. Um, is that fair to say since yes. the bubble, he's just been gone. Well, yeah. so he missed all of last year with the ACL, which is definitely causing us to kind of forget about him. But I agree. There are some times where even when he does play, he puts up 25, 30 one night. He kind of takes a night off for injury management. They'll come back to the same thing. It's kind of just back and forth the whole way. And it's kind of the same story this year. Yeah. So but anyway, we get we forget how good he is. Yes. That's my exact point. Like when he came onto that Raptors team and then just won the championship in one year, you're like, oh yeah, I forgot about this guy. This is the guy that shut down LeBron in the finals. Like, you know, this guy can play here. Like he's not by any stretch a bad player. And I think he's one of the most underrated and again, he shows that here today where he puts up a game that has 38 points and he's very efficient shooting wise. He uh, always has been efficient as a player and he just matches it up with great defense as well. I mean, you want to talk about like one of the best two way players in NBA history, especially for like a smaller player, like a like a forward. He like a sh- small forward. He's probably like up there as one of the best. Oh, he's like, I don't even like in just I'm talking about specifically both sides of the ball being the best at both i mean he's probably like the only other guy that i can really think of in recent years is Tom- clay thompson in terms of like the def- both sides of the ball yeah because he was a great defender he was well earlier in his career he was definitely no yeah i think defender. Giannis might be entering that category i think he's got work to do offensively but defensively he's right there but yeah anyway the claw i mean he he finds a way to get it done Kawhi leonard is honestly one of my favorite players to watch i have to say i that is definitely something that he has done for me is he he i like the way that Kawhi leonard plays basketball a lot yeah i love the way he plays too just the shots that he takes too and the fact that he makes them i mean you see the fadeaways in the corner how about last night i don't know if you've noticed this he had a lot of moments where he get kind of near the paint kind of not know what to do. And then he'd find a way to use his pivot foot and make these off balance, like floaters. And you know what it is too? What else I noticed is like when he does something bad, I feel like, like it's a poor decision. He immediately makes up for it. A hundred percent. Yeah. He kind of just forgets about it, which is the right mindset to have. Mm-hmm. But I'm looking at the game itself. And obviously Kawhi Leonard is the main reason I think why the Clippers won. And listen, I know that the box score might not show this, especially with the, 
field goals attempted and field goals made. But I thought Russell Westbrook was phenomenal last night in other areas. I know he was three for 19. He was really good the floor. passing the ball. He only had nine points. But like you said, he had eight assists. And I think the rebounds is the thing that sticks out to me. He had 11 rebounds. And all of the key rebounds are at the end. I mean, I don't know if you saw this one stretch, but there might have been a couple minutes left in the fourth quarter. He grabbed, I think, two or three offensive rebounds in one or two possessions. And then there were a couple of times where he would save the ball from going out of bounds and knock it off someone on the Suns. Yeah, how about and that he one was at the all end? over. Yeah, that was a phenomenal play. That was also an amazing play. He blocked Devin Booker's two-point attempt when the Clippers were up three. And so he got the ball back there. I think that was the play actually you're referring to. But yeah, he was phenomenal. I just thought he was kind of just using his athleticism. That's how we love Russ. I mean, when he plays at 110%, like he says, and he's kind of using his athleticism, he's really fun to watch. But I think the key for the Clippers is recently they've kind of tried to build this team around, obviously, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, who's not playing in the series because of injury. But they have other guys who can chip in. I mean, you look at Zubats, a pretty decent game. Eric Gordon, a midseason pickup at 19 points. Terrence Mann, solid 10 points. Norman Powell, who they picked up. Last year, you had 14 points. They issued a lot of guys who can kind of score around the teens. And over time, those points are going to add up. Yeah, absolutely. You need solid contributing. And from a guy like Aaron Gordon or Eric Gordon to get 19, that's pretty good. Yeah. But Eric Gordon. Eric Gordon. But let's flip it to the Phoenix side. And we know that they're very top heavy in the starting five. You look at Durant, Booker, Paul, and Aiden. Those are the four guys you're going to probably focus on. And Chris Paul was the one who stood out because he did not have a great game offensively. He only had seven points. Listen, he had 11 boards and 10 assists, which is nothing to fret upon. But the thing with the Suns is, listen, those four guys are going to be great more often than not. But look at the bench. The bench had 10 points across. I mean, you look at some people, they only played seven minutes, seven minutes, five minutes, eight minutes, 24 minutes, four minutes. They got no help. So I think... Going for it, I mean, listen, you could let Booker and Durant, whoever, score all you want, but you got to get help otherwise. Because if one of them has an off night, you're in trouble. Yeah, and they kind of – Chris Paul did not have a great night in terms of scoring. I mean, obviously, he made up for it by somehow grabbing 11 rebounds. I'm not really sure how that happens, but shout out Chris Paul being the <laughs> smallest guy on the court getting 11 rebounds. But he obviously had the assist 10, which you would come to expect from Chris Paul. Obviously, he was one of the best point guards uh, in our generation. But how about, I mean, for the Suns, I, I think the biggest surprise had to be Tory Craig. Yeah. Like, where did that I mean, come from? I mean, that's the wild card. He's the other starter in that starting lineup. And he's obviously the least talked about just because the other four are very notable players. But yeah, out of nowhere with 22, I believe. I mean, that's... Definitely something that you wouldn't expect, but and honestly, too, I feel like Zubats kind of outplayed Aiton down yeah, low. He kind of just bodied him. Yeah, he kind of did. He was way more physical with Aiton than I think Aiton wanted. And Aiton's gonna have to step up because he got a lot of shots, and a lot of them were good lot of shots too. And I felt like he had like a lot of them that he could have made. Yeah, like they were they were good looks, like they're ones that he has to come up with, especially in the time that he took them. But also at the same time too. Devin Booker over did not hit a single three pointer. Yeah, that's bad. Yeah. I mean, that's a guy who's gonna probably make a couple threes, a few threes a night. And to not have any is not too concerning. It's just an off night, I think. But yeah, but you combine that with the fact that Paul only had seven points and yeah, that, and the bench did nothing. You yeah. Gotta see why. And that's kind of the thing with the Suns. I remember back when they made the finals in 2021, they had a way better bench. And I know they gave away some pieces can't... to get Durant, and so they kind of forfeited some of the bench there. But they, they, I think that's the problem though. If like Durant scores 25 30, Booker does the same, Chris Paul's like 20 ish, and then Aiton's like 20 ish. I mean, if they get no none from the bench, I mean, it might not be enough. Well, looking at this bench though, like realistically, who who can score for them? Okay, Shamit, Terrence Ross, and then TJ Ward didn't even play, but I know that he can score. Yeah, Terrence Ross and Landry Shaman are probably the two guys. A Kogi is more of a defensive player. Yeah, Wayne Wright is Biombo's a defensive player. Not just player. a guy that plays. Yeah, Biombo is a defensive player. Landell's a younger guy. Yeah, I think I think it's something to keep your eye on though. Yeah, this they're gonna, they might have to make a switch there. I would look at TJ Warren, maybe getting him some. Yeah, he can score. Yeah, I mean he scored in the bubble. It was amazing in the yeah. bubble. Yeah, I'm not too concerned with the Suns. Um, I think the thing for them is they need to start faster. They had an awful first quarter. I mean, you can't get down 
by that much and then also get down by more in the second quarter. So I think they need to start a little faster. But if I'm the Suns, though, yeah, you got to win game two. You can't go to L.A. down 2-0. Same goes for the Grizzlies and the Bucks. But let's go to the final game of the night. And this is probably the least talked about series. So we can make this probably a little quicker if you want, unless you have some things to say. But we have the Wolves and the Nuggets. They squared off in Denver. And early on, I mean, it was a pretty decent game. But Denver hit another gear especially at the end of the second quarter. And they just carried that throughout the second half, especially in the third quarter. They outscored Minnesota 32 to 14. And you know what? It was kind of just how I thought this game. And I think the rest of the series will go. Denver's just so much deeper. And Minnesota, honestly, on paper, you look at Anthony Edwards, Rudy Gobert, and Carl Anthony Towns. I mean, like, if those are your three best players, you're probably going to be like a pretty decent team. But I think the difference is Denver has like the same thing, but more. And then they have the depth. I mean, you look at Jokic, Murray, Porter Jr., Gordon, Cobo Pope. It's just a lot. So, yeah, Denver's just the better team. They're just loaded top to bottom. Yeah, they're be- they're better than the Timberwolves are. That's that's the easiest way to describe it, right? Yeah, and I think they hit a gear in the second half where they kind of just turned it on. They were kind of just going through the motions early on. So I think once they found their groove, they uh, obviously cruised to a big win. So. I think this is going to happen a couple of times in the series. Now, if Minnesota somehow steals game two, I think that changes the conversation completely. But I just think Denver, because they're better coach, they have more depth and their star power is just, I think, a tad better. I think that that's why they have the advantage. Yeah, I agree. They definitely have the advantage. All right. Should we move on a little bit? Yeah, we have some NFL to get into. We do. Um, Where should we start? Let's start with your boy Jalen Hurts, Jeffrey. Uh, the quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles is a rich man today. Um, he signed a five-year, $255 million contract extension. And if you do the math on that, five divided by um, 255, not bad. It's really not that bad for <laughs> like a quarterback at his level. It comes down to 51 million. I would say in the grand scheme of things, that it is not bad at all for the kind of quarterback that Jalen Hurts is. And I would hope that he just continues to play at the level that he did last year, but I mean, he was the second best player in football last year. Obviously the chiefs got a huge jump on Patrick Mahomes and signed him for a number that looks cheap now, but at the grand scheme of things, 51 million, it's going to be interesting to see what Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow get. Cause they're in the same draft class as Jalen hurts. And I think the Eagles kind of did some, some smart moves here by going early and trying to get this done, because I think there's a very good chance that, especially with the Bengals and the Chargers, that they they may not throw as much money at those guys. Um, and I think those guys are definitely going to play hardball because they're certainly worth the $50 million mark as well. And no offense to Jalen Hurts, I do think Joe Burrow is a little bit of better quarterback than he is. And so I would think that he would specifically get a higher number. Whereas Herbert, I, I'm not really sure. I think it would depend a lot because – LA really has a bad cap situation right now. It's not great. Um, So that's interesting too, to kind of see how those contracts compare versus Jalen's. But for right now, I think 51 million, I I don't think that's an overpay at all. That's kind of what I expected. I think if they could have got anything under 50, it would have been like, honestly, a bargain. Yeah, I agree. I like the deal a lot. I think a lot of the rumors before the deal was signed was Hertz is going to get a lot. Now we didn't know the number specifically, but you'd think it'd be, I guess, around 50 per year. And he got 51. So I think it is a good deal. And I also like the five years. I actually like that, I think, a little more than the money. Listen, the money's great, but I think the five-year deal is good because, listen, it secures him long-term in Philly, which is what we all want. And I think he deserves it just based on his play last year specifically. But he's kind of just risen through the ranks. I mean, he's a second-round pick in 2020, didn't start right away. Then he starts kind of late in the year. And then... He has this like okay year in 2021. They get in the playoffs and it, but it was there were some question marks thrown around Hertz, right? Like there were there was definitely a lot of question marks. And I think the the turning point to kind of answer some of those question marks is we kind of started running the ball just a lot, and it kind of tailored I would say it's more really if it's just like, that. And I think the additions of like AJ Brown, yeah, specifically, and De- drafting Devontae players. Smith. I mean, those are two key guys. Not to mention Dallas Goddard, but I think we kind of just tailored the offense to his strengths. I think that's a huge reason why he's kind of jumped into this upper stratosphere of QBs. But I love the five years though, because like I said, it locks him up long-term. It also gives you some 
leeway where let's say he has like i don't know the first like two years are like i don't know not as good as you expected not saying it's gonna happen but say like eagles make the playoffs but they lose like wild card weekend or whatever now you has three more years and you think all right we'll try him out i mean he's obviously gonna be a good quarterback but i think it gives you freedom as to you're not locked into him forever but you're locked into a good amount of time where you believe in him enough where you think he can hopefully win you a super bowl obviously he was very close last season but yeah, I think the fact that the Eagles, like you said, got him help over the years and also his in- internal improvement helped them get this deal. Yeah. And I think the biggest question going forward is just can the O-line continue to be at the high level that it was? Obviously, I know Lane and Jason Kelsey are getting a little bit older, but there's still some other moves that they've made. Howie Roseman's made, like getting Malata, Dickerson, like they have other good linemen. They got to make sure they just keep that as a strength of the team because I feel like that has allowed the Eagles to be so successful on offense. And I think it's been a great way for Hertz to enter the league. And I think if you took that away from him, I don't know if it would be the same impact. I think that's fair, but that's true with any quarterback. And then the next thing is how is he going to do without Shane Steichen, right? This is going to be a realistically, when has the Eagles offense been at its best the last two years? That's been when Shane Steichen's calling the plays because remember Sirianni did it originally when they first came into his position with the Eagles as the head coach, and he was not that successful at it. And now they have a new guy. Um, his name's Ben Johnson. Um, to be honest, I don't even know. Yeah. He's, I know Sean Desai is the new defensive coordinator. Yeah. Well, this guy is not from, about the offense. He's got some connections to Jalen hurts pretty much. And that's kind of the reason that he is where he is. Um, and I don't know. I think it's just a question of how they do without Steichen. Um, yeah. And every year is different. Oh, I'm but... sorry. That's not his name. I'm getting him confused with somebody else. The Eagles new OC now is, oh no, his name is Brian Johnson, not Ben Johnson. Brian Johnson. You got the Johnson part, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So this guy, Brian Johnson, he's going to be the the new orchestrator of the offense and if I remember correctly, he worked with Hertz. Um, yeah, he worked with Hertz previously. I think there's like a connection there between the two of them. So that is where that comes from. Yeah, I definitely think it's a legitimate question to bring up as to whether or not Hertz will have as much success under Johnson as he did with Steichen. Mm-hmm. And obviously, there's, there's going to be a new group of guys every year. I think the notable piece that he won't have is Miles Sanders. And but so, I think he'll be able to replace that. Yeah, you'd think Gainwell would be the guy to kind of fill in there. And they also signed, signed Rashad Penny, so he's going to be in the mix, you would think. But having Brown, Smith, and Goddard, obviously huge, very important. They're huge for Jalen Hurts. Yeah, and I think the next thing will be signing Devontae Smith, right? Because it is not that far yeah, away. Yeah, they sign A.J. Brown. I think Devontae Smith's probably next to one. Yeah, and I don't know. It's going to be tough to – the Eagles are paying a lot of guys. A lot of guys are yeah. going to need. You can't please everyone. I'll tell you what, though. They'll need to. Uh, they're going to have to keep make sure they keep drafting well on defense because they're going to have to fill some holes. Yeah. And also on the O-line, you, like you mentioned, Johnson and Kelsey. Yeah, when, if, when, if Jason Kelsey only plays one more year, that is going to be so tough to replace. Like literally, how does anybody fill either yeah. of those two shoes? It's really, Kelsey or Johnson. Uh, it's really the right side that's kind of the question mark. The left side seems like it's fine. I mean, you got Milad and Dickerson. Yeah. And they're both younger too, so that helps. It's not yeah. like you're going to pay them like right away, but I think the right side is definitely going to be an area to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you saw this, and we were talking about this off the air, but Bryce Young, he canceled his remaining pre-draft visits after meeting with the Panthers and the Texans. Yeah, it's expected he goes number one, according to Schefter, and I would kind of see that being the best play for the Panthers. Um, I think him or Stroud should be number one. I don't think any of the other options. Like, who do you like more? Like, if you had the number one pick, like, who would you take? It's tough because I I know this is actually going to be, like, a little bit – this is going to sound a little bit crazy. But I think, believe it or not, that C.J. Stroud might have actually had a better offense around him. Okay. Than Bryce Young did. I, I think mean, Bryce receiving Young, wise, I think Ohio Bryce, State has some great receivers. Yeah, the receivers, receivers, absolutely. And then also, also the Ohio State all line was really good this year. Really good. It was. Um, like they're gonna have quite a few guys get drafted. They're they're gonna be like some of them might be later on, but still very talented. And C.J. had a full offense around him. 
And I still just feel like he never could. He made the – he looked awesome in the college football playoff. But, you know, in those games against Michigan, I just can't help but question some of the tactics. Like, I just felt like he never really um, stepped up. Yeah. Like, I was waiting for him to do more. Um, whereas with Bryce, I know that he as well has had a very talented offense around him. And I think it's fair to ask for both those guys, what is it going to be like when they go to the NFL and they're playing with – guys who are not nearly as good in their in their area as the players from Alabama and Ohio State were because most of those guys are five-star recruits but I still think that Bryce Young is very talented I love his ability to escape within the pocket I think it's right up it's going to be probably his strength right away nah, frame but like you said he can escape the pocket and I'm looking at their stats right now over their college careers they have very similar stats. They I mean, they're pretty close. I mean, you look at completions, completion percentage, yards, touchdowns. I mean, they're like right there, neck and neck with each other. And Bryce Young's 2021 season was a lot better than his 2022 season. But Definitely. I, but I think if you look at that Bryce Young, you're like, okay, this guy's amazing. If he had that season this year, he would. And the same can be said for CJ Stroud too, mm-hmm. I think. But like you said. CJ Stroud definitely. I actually kind of agree with what you said, and I know you said it might sound crazy, but I'm just thinking about it now. I would say had Smith and Jigba, Marvin Harrison Jr., other guys I probably can't even think of. Garrett Wilson, um, Alave, Alave. I mean, they had a lot of good receivers. And I know that uh, Bryce Young had Mechie and Jameson Williams and other guys, but they're not. I don't. I would say that they didn't have to. And obviously, Mechie didn't play, and Jamison didn't play either. Um, but you know, even the guys who were there last year at Alabama, I don't even think are on the level that Jackson Smith, Najaba, and Marvin Harrison Jr. are. So that's just why I'm giving. Like, I, I still respect Bryce. I think he might have played on a little bit not as talented of a team. And despite that, I, I do think Bryce is the better player. Yeah, we'll find out, though. The draft is coming up uh, next Thursday, so we're going to find out then. Yeah, and I think that's going to be ultimately who goes number one. Bryce, probably got a one. I would assume the Texans are going quarterback at two, but if they don't, then it gets get very weird. interesting. Very yeah, things get crazy. Because the Cardinals will get – that. The, you know who's praying that the Texans don't take a quarterback? The Cardinals, because if they can get a – if you can jump up for C.J. Stroud – I would imagine the Raiders are thinking about calling. I would imagine there's a chance that a team like the um, – who else? The Seahawks would even consider going up. I mean, there has to be countless teams who are thinking about going back up there. I mean, specifically the Raiders, just because, you know, when you look at where they're at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I still think that there's going to be a lot of craziness in this draft too. I, I would not be surprised if one of the big quarterbacks fell. That's that's one of the things that I'm Yeah, there's other guys like Anthony Richardson. Yeah, Richardson and Will Levis. They're like the other guys who are rumored to go in the top. I've seen a lot of rumors about Richardson maybe going high, and I've also seen him visit a lot of teams. So Yeah, Richardson is kind of bouncing around. Based on what the the scouting of him, it seems like there's a lot of people who think that he's either going to be really good or really bad, and there's not much in the middle. Like, there's just – there's either people who love him or hate him. Like, Mm -hmm. he has visited a decent amount of teams, though. It's interesting. The Ravens have actually brought him in for a visit, Mm -hmm. which is leads me to my next thing that I wanted to bring up. Um, Last thing here in our NFL little wrap-up. The Ravens have a a new offer for Lamar Jackson, and it includes $200 guaranteed, which, by the way, would be more more than Jalen Hurts got. Um, I don't know how he can turn that down. I think that's the last final offer. They want to get this thing done. They really want to. I think that's the knockout punch. And if Lamar doesn't accept that, then I don't know what he's looking for. Yeah, if he doesn't accept it, I think he's crazy. Yeah, because if it's, I would assume that's for about five years, and if it's two hundred million guaranteed, that would be the most guaranteed besides Deshaun Watson, obviously. But yeah, we would only be like a thirty million, thirty or forty million dollar difference between him and Deshaun. So if you're saying it's two hundred guaranteed, if that's the and offer, that's, and that's, that's just guaranteed, right? I mean, the, the contract itself is more money. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it might not be much more. I don't yeah, know. But the fact that you would get that right off the bat guarantee, like you said, I don't know how you turn that down. I don't either. And also, you got to take into 
consideration Lamar has missed the ending of two seasons in a row due to injuries. So it's not like he comes with no medical concerns whatsoever. I don't know how much better of a deal he's going to get. Yeah, I would try to secure that. Yeah, I mean, we all know what he is on the field. I mean, he's a great player. I think that's a fair offer for both teams. And that was via Ian Rappaport on the Pat McAfee show. So, so that is a credible source. Yeah, that is a credible <laughs> source. All right, Jeff, anything else to add? I don't think so. I think we kind of ran through everything today. Certainly. Yeah, well, thank you for listening. We'll be back on Friday talking some more NBA and NHL playoffs and more hot sports topics. So thank you as always, and we'll see you on Friday.